So we have finally made it to the end of it all. And so this series of videos has been looking at the ending of the war. And this final, 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 final one uh, pulls together all of the important pieces of information from this whole section, which looks at why the armistice was signed. And so Germany signed the armistice on November 11th, 1918, after about six weeks of extreme political and civil unrest. And this marks her official exit from the war. So the question is, how did all of these various elements come together to encourage Germany to sign an armistice? And you can see uh, from this image, this is the German delegation on the left as they arrive to sign the armistice provisionally ending World War I in a railway dining car. So on September 28th, after the failure of the spring and summer offensives, generals Ludendorff and Hindenburg agreed that Germany had no choice but to surrender. And if they did not surrender, the German army would be completely destroyed and Germany invaded. And so they started encouraging the Kaiser to, you know, like pull out of this one. By the beginning of November, the German forces were in complete retreat and the morale of soldiers had pretty much also completely collapsed. And so the decision to seek armistice was influenced by events on other fronts as well. The central powers had basically collapsed. The Bulgarians were defeated uh, and they asked for an armistice on 29th of September. The Ottomans agreed to a peace deal on October 30th and Austria on November so pretty much by the time we get to November, Germany was fighting on her own and there was no way that she could continue fighting. Which brings us to kind of think about it all together. And so here for the next bit, we're going to begin pull together many of the elements discussed in the section of World War I and in the other sections to help explain why Germany lost the war. And this image here is uh, Buckingham Palace in Britain on Armistice Day. Gobs and gobs and gobs of people came out to cheer the signing of this document. So pulling it all militarily, Germany didn't do so hot. Now, you know, you kind of know by the spring offensives of 1918 that Germany has lost the war. But really, it was inevitable by December 1915 because they were forced to fight a two-front war. And this two-front war burned through much of their military personnel and resources. And by the time we get to the Somme and the Third Battle of Ypres, the German army has been severely weakened. And then Operation Michael failed. And as you can see there, the Germans did change their tactics during Operation Michael. You can see stormtroopers advancing through um, clouds of smoke toward enemy positions. And this was good and they managed to push ahead. However, by the time they get to Operation Michael, um, they didn't have enough. And the spring offensives used up all of the res reserves that they had. So you had an additional 1.75 million casualties in 1918. They were just running out of men. Germany thought that once they defeated Russia on the Eastern Front, that this would be cool, right? They could um, move all of the soldiers that they had fighting uh, Russia in the East to the West and do a big push. But these troops had also been fighting for years. They were exhausted. So they were unable to provide the big impact that Germany needed in the final months of the war. And again, you also have, at the beginning of the war, the most disciplined army of all of the fighters. The most disciplined, the best. And remember, basically Germany hadn't lost a war since like the 1700s. And so... By the time we get to this point, mutinies are happening, soldiers are deserting the army. And then finally, Ludendorff and Hindenburg lost their nerve at a crucial time. And they basically handed power over to the civilian government saying that the war could not be, be won. They were like, pshaw, we done went and lost this, y'all handle it. 
Another problem for Germany was that they had pretty poor choice of allies. With the exception of Germany, the central powers were quite militarily weak. Now, we've looked at the charts um, previously that looked at the industrial capacity of the different countries in the central powers, um, the numbers of men they could bring, uh, the um, size of their navies and stuff like this. Basically, Germany was the star in all of this, and nobody else uh, had the capacity uh, that Germany did, and therefore they didn't have the capacity to be equal to the Entente powers. Germany had to support Austria-Hungary against Russia throughout much of the war, and they also had to send um, people down to help Austria-Hungary out while as they were fighting Italy. And basically, this depleted Germans, the German forces, as they were spread pretty thin. The Ottomans couldn't uh, contribute because the Ottoman Empire fragmented under the Arab Revolt. And so the Ottomans spent most of their time actually trying to deal with internal troubles rather than really giving a push uh, toward helping the German war effort. So Germany, she got some military problems. She made some real bad friends when she decided to go to war. And on top of that, things are a hot mess at home. We've spoken about um, the political, economic, and social factors uh, of the home front in greater detail in previous video. And so this is just a summation. So the naval blockade of Germany meant a shortage of resources for the people. So that's one. On top of that, the German government basically spent 83% of their money on the military and only 2% on the people. And now, on top of that, in some parts of the country, agricultural production had fallen by as much as 70%. So, huge amount of shortages at home. And you, what you're going to have is the resultant deaths and illnesses. And all of this leads to massive political and social unrest, which of course leads to revolution. Additionally, um, President Wilson's peace terms gave them a way out. People, especially once you have the civilian government in place, right? People are tired of war. They've been isolated because all of their allies have been defeated. And they're really fearful of what the revolution could bring if they don't stop. So eh, things weren't working so good for the Germany. Now, of course, definitely, we know that Germany helped Germany lose the war, but we also have to consider what the other side or the Entente powers brought to the field. One of the things is that when we look at the combined industrial capacity of the US and Britain, it was massive. And these were two of the most industrially developed countries at the time. And Germany and her allies could not match that. And so in the end, that industrial capacity is going to mean more munitions, more tanks, more bombs, more artillery produced. Another thing is they had a greater number of men. So a war of attrition would ultimately benefit the side with the greatest numbers. And Germany and her allies could not keep up with that, especially once the Americans joined the war. And the Americans brought in fresh troops, whereas the German troops were exhausted after years of fighting. Once the U.S. joins the war, and to be fair, even before that, the U.S. provided credit to France and Britain in order to purchase war supplies, and Germany could not match that. So again, um, it's like that, that economic component is going to give the Entente Allied powers a, a leg up on Germany. The naval capacity and capability of Britain, and then when the U.S. Um, joined, allowed the Allied powers to maintain control over the sea. And Germany could not match this. They were able to blockade Germany and prevent her from getting resources. And we've seen this previously, the disastrous, catastrophic impact that it had on Germany.
Another thing is they were able to maintain their own supplies. This meant that Britain was able to gain um, resources from her colonies. Britain was also able to get, bring in huge numbers of men from India, from uh, colonies in Africa, from um, Australia and New Zealand to be able to come and fight. And basically, this capacity also hooked them up because in 1917, when Germany did their last ditch effort of the unrestricted um, submarine warfare, they actually were able to neutralize the effectiveness of the U-boats. So this thing, the submarines on which Germany was basically counting on a lot, was essentially no use to them. Additionally, got to keep in mind that especially in Britain and France, they are fighting, well, I'm sorry, Britain and Belgium, they are fighting for their home. And so they were uh, unwilling to let go. The Allies also changed their tactics throughout the war. They started using creeping barrages armed with uh, warfare. The traditional barrages was send, you know, artillery, artillery, bum, 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 bum. And finally, finally, they realized that um, trying to bomb and then, um, and then sending a huge wave of men over the top didn't work. It just got you a lot of dead men. And so they started doing the creeping barrages, which really kind of helped them to uh, take and keep what they got. Essentially, there was a shift to modern warfare that took advantage of all of the technological developments of the day. And this also included better coordination of their resources. So we are, by the time we get to near the end of the war, we have functioning tanks, um, we have bigger and better artillery, we have um, better aircraft that can also drop bombs. And so tanks, artillery, aircraft, and infantry were working together, maximizing the potential of each. And Finally, one of the things that the Allies were able to do was convince Greece to abandon her neutrality. And this allowed the Allied forces to be able to advance through the Balkans and attack the Bulgarians and the Austro-Hungarians, which, well, they won, didn't they? So, let's put it all together. Pull it all together. Take the time, go through the previous notes, and answered these two questions. So one, why was Germany's defeat in World War I inevitable? Remember to put in your own opinions on there, and that is your analysis based on what you know. And also include specific historical evidence. And then finally, how far was the failure of the Ludendorff Offensive responsible for the defeat of Germany in 1918? So Focus on the Ludendorff uh, Offensive, but also make sure that you write a counter argument. And here is the surprise! Knock, knock. Who's there? Tank! Tank who? <laughs> You're welcome! <laughs> Jeannie, out.